I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. You know, belief doesn't mean having tunnel vision. Belief means that if you believe in something, you're able to course correct, you're able to adapt. That's also one of the biggest skills of an entrepreneur is to adapt and not just be locked into one way of doing it. And so, you know, hearing that feedback is one of the greatest things you can get as an entrepreneur. But how do you deal with like doubt? So for instance, if if you run down a a bad road in product development or if you hit a bunch of stores and they're just like, eh, we don't like it, it's not for us. Like, and then you start to really, you know, because you, because you've, because you've given them status just by the fact that you're pitching them, or you know, a bunch, a focus group says, ah, we don't really like this food. Like, so again, you're giving status to some group, and you have to, you have to reasonably handle their criticism, but it could cause doubt, even though this is something you've believed in for decades and you've you've built it up perfectly. Doubt must occur, and how do you? Sometimes doubt you can't just pivot, you have to actually question, is this good or not? Yeah. So Bill Glazer, CEO of Outstanding Foods, which if you haven't tried it, we're going to get to it in a second. But Bill, so good to see you. When's the last time we saw each other? Great to see you. Yeah. I think the last time we saw each other was in LA, maybe two years ago. Yeah. I think you dropped off a bunch of, I think wherever I was staying, you dropped off a whole bunch of like, um, the outstanding foods, the the bacon, the, the bacon product, yeah, like the bacon chips. Yeah. And now you have, and by the way, we'll get to all the details in a second. Now you have this new product, the pork rinds. But there's so many interesting things in this story. One is, I kind of think this is like the 21st century great example of how entrepreneurship should be done. And I'll get into our story in a second. But also, something that happened to me a few years ago, and I think that in parallel to it happening to you was that I decided I'm only going to get involved with businesses that I truly care about and I think could have an impact on the world. Not in this kind of like, you know, oh, social impact is, you know, I only want to make money if it, I clearly want to make money, but it's sort of the companies I care the most about and I think will make the most money are the ones where I think actually do some good in the world. And you did the same here. Like you, so what, why don't you describe this product, but then I want to also describe how we meet because that's a fun story. Yeah, so we make snack foods that are all plant-based, but that are high in nutrition and protein, and that tastes like meat. So our first products are under our Pig Out brand. We made a bacon snack, like you said. We just launched our plant-based pork rind. We call it Pig Out Pigless Pork Rinds, and it's got seven grams of protein per serving, same as ground beef. It tastes amazing. Whether you've had pork rinds or you've never had them, 
It's a great tasting snack with a great texture and it's got health benefits and, and in particular protein. You could actually eat this after you work out instead of mixing the same smoothie or eating the same energy bars over and over again. And for me, the genesis of how this started was twofold. One, I've been plant-based for 30 years and I had always, I've been an entrepreneur and I've been in finance and I've always thought about doing a business that was plant-based, but I, I wanted it to be something that could make an impact to your point of, of not just doing something to make money and doing something where I'm selling vegan products to vegan consumers, but where I can make it easier for anyone to eat more plant-based foods and, and not because they're being preached at, but yeah, because if you're if you're not a plant-based person, plant-based foods suck. <laughs> like, and I'm not I, I know they're getting better, but it's just if you're used to eating steak, pasta, fish, whatever, and then you go and and go to the vegan aisle in I don't know, uh, the grocery store and oh, I'll take the kale chips. It's just the worst. Like I don't like them, but I'll eat and I'm not trying to advertise this like uh I'll eat these and they're excellent. They get addictive. Like Steve, they got you got addicted, yes, right? 100%. So, yeah, well, the, there's a shifting paradigm and you're you're 100% right. In the past, if you were a meat eater and you ate steak, you you to go to the plant-based burger or meat replacements, they were rubbery, they tasted like cardboard. They you had to make a sacrifice. And and there's a lot of reasons why people are choosing to eat more plant-based foods, but in the past you had to make a sacrifice, which meant incorporating a new habit. And and for most people incorporating a new habit is very, very challenging. And, and if you're a company selling a product, extremely challenging to have to have someone adopt a new habit before they could even buy your product. Yeah, I remember the first time, I guess I was like 30 something, I decided, oh, I'm gonna try getting into healthier foods. And someone told me, you gotta drink wheatgrass every morning. And literally I would have like a gag reflex every time I drank this thing. And then, um, and and I want to I want to kind of go backwards a little bit because the way you're building up this company is so fascinating and it's so different from how these previous let's let's call them plant-based food companies have developed and just in general you're kind of combining your finance background, your 30 year, 30 year background in plant-based foods uh and also inter, oddly internet marketing in how you're building this up even though this is appearing in stores like uh, everything from Whole Foods to Kroger's to Costco. Can you talk about QVC? You're going to be on QVC with this? Yes. Yeah, we're going to be on QVC. I don't know when this is airing, but soon. And we're going to air this after Snoop Dogg announces Snoop. his involvement with it. So we're, we'll talk about that in a second. Yes. But I remember, and I'm going backwards in time, and then we're going to go backwards and forth. I remember when you, I, we've known each other for seven years, and about, I guess it was about three years ago, maybe, or four years ago, I went over Lewis Howe's house and his apartment in LA. And you were there and Chef Dave was there. And we'll talk about Chef Dave in a second. But suffice to say, you and him were partners in developing this. And Dave had just been head of product development at Beyond Meats and the Beyond Burger, which is huge now. And he was joining forces with you to create this. So you guys uh, cooked lunch for Lewis and me. And we had um, pasta. We had a Big Mac hamburger. We had bacon we had uh, 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 vanilla ice cream and none of it had dairy, none of it had meat, none of it had uh, carbs except for the bun of the Big Mac. And so like the the um, the pasta was all mushrooms. Yes. And it was excellent. It wasn't like, again, some crappy mushroom thing I would eat in like a vegan place. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's for me was the other piece of not only making an impact, but having to find or partner with someone who has this unique ability, Chef Dave Anderson, who, who, as you mentioned, led product development at Beyond Meat. He helped create the Beyond Burger, which has been a phenomenon and a runaway success. He's got a really unique ability to use plant-based ingredients to get meaty tastes and textures. I mean, it tasted exactly like pasta. And I think there was like a cashew sauce on top of it as opposed to cheese. So it was like, quote unquote, cream-based pasta. And it was just amazing. Like I want, I called you up a few weeks later. I wanted more and I'm still waiting for that product to be developed. Are you going to eventually develop that product? Yes, yeah. So we we started out with snack foods because, you know, in the in the theme of not creating new habits, we wanted to go where people were shopping. We didn't want to have to recondition them to go to the vegan meat aisle. And so everyone Which is key, right? Yes. Yeah, you I mean, Why is that key? Well, it, because if you know, with the exception of the scrolling on Facebook, which we none of us did in the past, but we all do it now, although they tapped into 
a behavior that we all liked about knowing what our friends are doing, knowing what celebrities are doing. So it wasn't that much of a behavioral shift, but we, we still do something that we didn't do in terms of scrolling. But with the exception of that, most products, if you have to do something you're not used to doing, in particular with food, if, you, if you're eating something that doesn't taste as good as what you're used to, if it doesn't have a, a texture as good as you're, you're used to, if it's priced excessively higher than what you pay for the food that you eat, and if it's not sold where you, where you shop, then you have to do something different to be able to buy it and, and enjoy it. And so, you know, for us, it's all about having those elements where you just have to replace one product with the other and, and the, you don't even have to think about it. You don't have to force yourself to eat it. You're eating it because it tastes great and you love it. But there's, there's so many aspects of this in terms of building a, a food business that's being sold in stores. And, and again, this is almost a small part of the story, but I, I just want to hit on this. Like I was once invested in a, a protein water drink and we were in Whole Foods, but it's so hard to get shelf space. And then you have to get good shelf space. You have to, you know, there's a reason why Coca-Cola cans are like right in the middle, you know, they're not too high up, they're not too low down, they're right in the middle of the aisle. Like they dominate the aisle and they pay for that spot. And it's hard to kind of, how are you gonna replace Lay's potato chips on the aisle in a Kroger's? It's in, and, and then on top of it, then you have to manage, it's very hard to manage you have hundreds of stores, say, selling your product. This is what would happen to us. We would have hundreds of stores selling the product. We'd have no demand. We have no idea month by month what the demand would be like and how much we need to manufacture. And if you do too much, you wasted money. And if you do too little, you're going to get kicked out of the stores. So it's, it's a hard business to run. Yeah. So to your point, and you touched on online marketing briefly, in the past, if you remember, and I had a company where we produced 30-minute infomercial. We had infomercials running on, on TV. And if you remember about 10 years ago and before, if you had an infomercial product that then went to stores, you would see as seen on TV. Right. And they'd always get the best space in the store. They'd get it at the, at the checkout, in the center aisle. They'd be in the circulars of the, of the big box retailers. And the retailers loved it because they were running media and people were walking into the store with awareness of their product because they already saw it. And so it was much easier for them to get shelf space as a result. But correct me if I'm wrong, the as seen on TV box, right? There was a company as seen on TV that would essentially buy that space in the stores. I, I might be wrong, but I thought that the, was the there case. Was a, there wasn't as seen on TV. There was a company that had the trademark and the logo. However, they the, all of the products that you saw in, in stores that were sold on TV weren't necessarily through them. Okay. So, But the point is that when you're running media, and you're not just a new product on the shelf where you have to do a lot of merchandising and in-store des or in-store demos. It's much more desirable for a, sh a store to give you that shelf space because they know when people see it on the shelf, it's not just a, an unknown new product. It's a product that a lot of people likely know about. So for us, we're in the new era of influencer marketing and influencers are driving uh, consumer decisions, right? So people are, are following what their favorite celebrities or influencers are recommending. And for us, instead of paying influencers, which the ROI on paying an influencer, you never know what you're going to get until you actually go out and do it. We had a, an approach of raising capital with celebrities and influencers so we can attract people that like our products, are connected to our brand, are authentic when they talk about our products and promote it. And when they do that, they're, they're, they're not checking the, the, uh, the contract and saying, oh shit, I have to post today. It's something that they want to do because they even wrote a check because they believe in it that much. And so we're running media. We're actually selling our product online, not only as its own way of uh, uh, dis distributing it and selling it, but as a way to create awareness so that we're, we're trickling that down into retail sales, both in getting on the shelves and having our product fly off the shelves. So, okay, I want to get to the influencer marketing in a second. I think that's really important because there's there's always been some form of influencer marketing, right? You have athletes on the boxes of cereal, you know, athletes on, you know, put out their own sneakers, uh, celebrities endorse this, endorse that. So there's always been some kind of like super celebrity uh, marketing. But now I think the bar has, I don't want to say lowered, but the universe has expanded of who has influence. So it's not just the people we see on TV, it's the people, um, different generations and different subcultures see and follow on their favorite social media. So if someone's got a huge Instagram following among a particular type of person, that might be 
uh, a good influencer for that group and, and so on. And so you basically encouraged people to invest in the company because this is a product that tastes good and also has social impact. It's plant-based. We always think plant-based is like good for the soul somehow. Yeah. So, you know, in our early parts of the strategy, you mentioned that we met uh, or we, we met earlier, but, uh, uh, you know, almost a few years ago when we were in R&D, the early stage investors were, were people that were much more connected to the mission of the company. They were people who were already vegan or vegetarian and, and saw what we were doing or what we were about to do as a way that they can make an impact through their investment. So we attracted people like Emily D. Chanel from Bones on, on ABC. We attracted Daniela Monet. We've attracted other people that connected to our mission. As we've progressed and had more products that are tangible, they're not just concepts, they're, they're in the stores, people are buying them, loving them. We've attracted all types of people that just love our products. Some of them are connected to our mission, some of them just see the opportunity, but all of them love our products and, and are not only willing, but uh, hyper fans you know, themselves to be able to then get their own fans and their followers to also be hyper fans. I, I wanna hear about the, the Snoop Dogg story from beginning to now, but tell me about uh, Chef Dave. So you guys met up with, you met him, you guys decided to work together. He was the head of product development at you know, Beyond Meats, one of the biggest plant-based foods companies in the world, if not the biggest. And first off, did he make a ton of money from Beyond Meats? I mean, that's huge now. So Dave and I met, Dave had a restaurant in Los Angeles. I used to go to his restaurant just about every day and sometimes twice a day. And we, we became friends and uh, we had talked about doing business together in the past, but he was at the time was partners with his wife. So it wasn't the right fit. Um, and then he was, he went off, he was a co-founder of Hampton Creek, which became just, and then he led product development for about four years at Beyond Meat. And so he left Beyond Meat because he wanted to get back to his chef crafted roots. He wanted to use more whole food ingredients. He fully subscribes and believes in what, uh, Beyond is doing and the impact that they're making, but he wanted to get more involved with, uh, using ingredients that he, uh, was more familiar with and, and less science. And that's, you know, really the genesis of how we connected. And, and yes, he did have options in Beyond Meat. He did well? Well, I, I don't want to speak on his behalf, but I think everyone that had stock in Beyond Meat early did very well. And then he has a very moving story too uh, that kind of happened th throughout all of this. I remember seeing it on Facebook, actually. I didn't yeah. know that much in depth about him before then. Yeah, I mean, Dave is someone that he's the one of the sweetest, kindest, uh, most generous guys, but it's truly a, 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 you know, smoke coming out of the ears kind of mad scientist talent, uh, a true genius, but he's had a lot of challenges in his life. But, you know, to his credit, he's overcome them. His, his former wife died, uh, leaving him with, you know, a lot of young kids to raise on his own. And, you know, instead of uh, being overwhelmed by it, he, he, you know, took the challenge and, you know, processed his uh, emotions and, and all the, the challenges that came with it and, you know, came out on the other side, uh, not only happier, but, you know, much more uh, enthusiastic about what he's doing and, and the impact he's making. And so you and I met, we met like seven years ago, I think, seven or eight years ago. You, and you even reminded me just now before this podcast started who introduced us, but we were going back and forth. We were emailing for months trying to figure out a time to meet and we had some interests in common and you had a deal you wanted me to look at and I was kind of in, doing lots of different small deals. And then just randomly, we were at the Tim Ferriss release of The 4-Hour Chef, right? So, and he had all these people cooking each meal, I remember. He had, and The 4-Hour Chef is basically how you could be like a master chef in yeah. four hours. And there was like 30 or 40 people at this dinner to, to for the book launch. And then we realized we were sitting right next to each other yeah. and we had been emailing for months and uh, we started talking then. And I don't know, you had some shitty deal. What was, what were you working on then? <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't as good as the one I'm doing now. Let's say yeah. that. It wasn't, it wasn't shitty, but it wasn't as good as what I'm doing Did now. Did you bring it public? You, it went public for a while, right? Not, not that company. Not yeah, that no, company. I had, an, I had other companies that I've taken public and, and you, you know, you and I have a lot of similarities in terms of our, our backgrounds. We both were in finance. We've both been entrepreneurial. I was the entrepreneur kid. I, I used to sell greeting cards and vegetable seeds door to door, literally at, at four or five years old. Um, and, uh, but I was in finance. I was in Wall Street and I, I've raised a bunch of money. I've taken companies public. 
and I've been an entrepreneur in my adult life, but this not only is, in my opinion, the, a better opportunity for me and for the people that are involved with it, but it's it's my passion. It's it's something that I've lived. I I was. Why'd you become a vegan? Why'd you become a plant based yeah, person? Yeah, I'm a visual person, so I didn't know what vegan was 30 years ago. I didn't know what plant based was. I didn't know what the alternative food choices were even at that point. But throughout my childhood, I would visualize what the food was on my plate. And if I would see a wing or a leg or an eye, I would think about what it was. And, and it just wasn't appetizing. When would you see an eye on your plate? I guess fish. Well, sometimes. fish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fish. Yeah. Or, or you know, maybe uh, a, a, an extra cut of beef they left a head on. But um, yeah, I know. I, I mean, I, I would visualize what it was on my plate and it just wasn't appetizing to me. So throughout my childhood, I stopped eating poultry. Then I stopped eating fish. I stopped eating pork. The last thing to go was beef. I stopped eating beef with bones. And then I was just left with burgers. And my father said, when I became vegan, McDonald's hung a black flag outside their corporate office mourning the loss <laughs> of their biggest customer because I used to go to McDonald's just about every day. Um, but the, the 30 years ago, as you know, someone that adopted a plant-based lifestyle, I've seen it change. It, it used to be something that people had a lot of misconceptions about in terms of getting your nutrients, in terms of being able to be fit. A lot of those stereotypes have come shattering down over the last several years. There's been a lot of more information that's out there. There's been some really great documentaries like Game Changers and What the Health. Um, and so there's been more of this demand for the products, but without products that, that taste like what they're replacing and that, like I said before, are, are, are in the same price point and sold where you shop, it doesn't matter what the reasons a consumer has to try to eat more plant-based, if they feel they have to make a sacrifice, most of them are going to stick with it. You know, um, I mean, so have you felt that there was a difference on your health when you started being, how old were you 30 years ago? Well, I was uh, early 20s and I didn't, I didn't have any health issues that I was aware of, but in, in reflection, a couple of years after I went vegan, I realized that I, don't get, I didn't get stomach aches anymore. And I used to get these really painful stomach aches that I just assumed were normal and never thought it was a health issue. And I, it, like I said, it wasn't even something consciously that was a reason, but it was after realizing for a couple of years that I didn't get them anymore that I made the connection that it was because of the diet change. So I, you know, I always see all these different diets and they all seem, and that people have come on the podcast talking about this diet, that diet, the other diet, they all seem equally good to me. The one real practical advice that I took to heart was try to avoid processed sugar as much as possible, which makes sense. And, um, but again, I always see differing opinions on, on different diets. And one, somebody was on the podcast recently who said she never uh, knew of a vegan over the age of a hundred. And so how would you respond to that? Is that even true? No, that's not true at all. Okay. In fact, you know, you, I think you interviewed the, the author of the blue zones and he talked, you know, which are these areas where most people live over a hundred and the predominant diet is either vegan or very close to being vegan. A lot of it, there's a lot of kind of Mediterranean style diet, which is largely vegan, but there's some kind of wild caught fish in those diets. Yeah, I mean, some some of those blue zones have some fish here or, you know, some minimal amount of animal products, but the vast majority of their diet are primarily right. uh, plant-based. And, uh, you know, I, I, I expect to be one of the oldest living vegans, uh, at, the, at you know, at least to a buck 20, if, if not if not longer. Uh, that's good memory, by the way, because Dan Buettner, the, the author of The Blue Zones, I think it was last on my podcast in 2014. So you were paying attention back back in the day. And then I just ran into, he lives in California, I think, and I just ran into him down the street here, like in the street. And so we agreed to, again, have a podcast at some point just to update on The Blue Zones and see what's new. But but that that's that's right. He I, I think a lot of those, like it was the Philippines, it was Mediterranean areas, it's actually one area um, in Aventuro, California. And there was these hot, hot pockets where um, people had a statistically significant um, potential to li not only live over 100, but have a high quality of life over 100. And a lot of it was diet-based and a lot of it was community-based as well. Yeah, So yeah, even though the one you're referring to in California were the Seventh-day Adventists yeah. who are completely plant-based. Oh, they're completely plant-based? Yes. That was the one I thought was more community-oriented but but yeah, you're right. They are they are a community. They they you know work on the fields. They mow their own lawns. They do a lot of things together. But yeah, they're they're predominantly plant based. And then I think it was you who were, I'm sure it was you. You were telling me 
Eric Schmidt, who's also been on the podcast, former CEO of Google, he was get, listing his top 10 trends for the next decade. And to everyone's surprise, surprise, his number one trend for the next decade was plant-based foods. Why do you think, I forgot to ask him this on my podcast, so that's kind of an idiot I am. Why do you think he said plant-based foods was his number one trend, like over yeah. AI, data, yes. robotics, genomics. Autonomous cars, everything. Yeah, they they at the time, they I believe it was six, what they called moonshots. And plant-based food, the the primary driver of Google, Google Ventures, which is was is an investor in Impossible Foods and and many others, a lot of lab grown meat companies uh, like Memphis Meats and some others, uh, and and a lot of Silicon Valley investors. The driving force behind disrupting animal agriculture is for environmental reasons. So they're taking a very scientific approach, and there's that part of the market that exists. Uh, Impossible Foods is in that realm. They they use genetically mod- modified ingredients. Uh, Eric Schmidt at that milking conference said people have to get over GMOs. We have a different perspective on that. We're, we're trying to use as much whole food, minimally processed ingredients and stick with uh, products that not only have the taste and the texture, but that are nutritious and um, without using ingredients you can't pronounce. Uh, but that community, they're very, very focused on disrupting animal agriculture from an environmental standpoint. And then when you started this, how did you convince Chef, Dave to work with you as opposed to anything else he was doing? Well, I was the lucky one that got the call. He and I had a relationship earlier. I I mentioned I used to go to his restaurant all the time. We talked about doing business together. And so uh, when he was thinking about leaving Beyond Meat, I got the call and and my answer was, hell yes, let's figure it out from there. So I think think there's... There's there's an important a couple important things to note kind of about the beginning of this and sort of the initial group that you put together to be shareholders. Like just as an example, again, you and I knew each other for many years beforehand or several years beforehand. And even though nothing had ever quite worked out, by the way, to be fair, I also showed you a bad deal or two. And <laughs> you know, so usually when that happens, people kind of drift apart, but we always had good conversations, good discussions about it. We were always very honest with each other. And so when you were doing the very first round for this, again, Lewis House was a friend of mine. He was a friend of yours. Like all these people sort of circulated around and you brought us together in this. Like I, did, I, all the people who I now realize knew you, who they're not connected to each other at all. You have a pretty wide network of people and it's kind of like you brought the, the I want to say the best and the brightest <laughs> together Put, uh, you had Dave, who you built up through years of relationship. You had Dave, Dave put together this meal, not just show us, oh, here's the bacon potato chip that we're going to, you need the meatless bacon potato chip that we're going to, he made a whole meal, like a four course or five course meal, all vegan or plant-based. And it was an amazingly delicious, like one of the best meals I've ever had. And so we all wrote checks on the spot. And then at the same time, you were bringing in these, you know, influencers as well in that round. And I think it was just, you know, just putting that together and thinking kind of two or three steps ahead, not only how are you going to have the best product, how are you going to have a narrative around that product? Like what you just said, how are you using, you know, whole sort of not so processed foods versus these other vegan companies? Like you had a kind of a vision that, that even though to the outside person might be the same, oh, it's another plant-based company. It actually had its own unique vision you brought in uh, a guy, Dave, with huge authority in the space because of Beyond Meat or Beyond Meat, and uh, and then you started immediately getting it in stores. The first product, the, the bacon flavored chips, you got right in the you know tasty section of the, the 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 real snack section, not the vegan snack section, in a whole bunch of places. Yeah, well, part of that was we created a brand that was more progressive. So, you know, if you look at our packaging, we have an edginess, we have a playfulness, we have humor. We use the word pig hell. Pig foods, pigless pork rinds. I'm looking at this pig uh, uh, dancing around. Yeah, and our, our pig, one of our, our lead investors is Rob Deerdeck. Uh, he's a, an extremely smart businessman and entrepreneur, but most people know him as a professional skateboarder and for his MTV show, Ridiculousness, that's been on for multiple seasons. But Rob was very active in the in the branding stage. And our pig wouldn't look like our pig, among other things, uh, if it weren't for Rob. So we brought in not only this network that can help promote it, but strategic investors that can open doors, strategic investors that can add their wisdom and their experience 
uh, whether it was for branding, whether it was for opening relationships to some of the retailers that were, were sold in. And, and it seems like, uh, again, I, I don't mean to, I'll, I'll let you finish that thought, but again, I'm always trying to figure out to break down the formula if there is one. And one is, you know, years of building relationships and, and that requires kind of being very straightforward, honest with them and continue keeping up with the relationship uh, doing something you believed in. So you had 30, it's not like any other random company, you had 30 years experience with this, as did Dave. And and then because you were doing something that had some sort of meaningful impact, as well as a high quality product that like tastes good, you're able to bring in these social media influencers. It's not as hard, you're not, it's not as transactional. It's not like, oh, I'm selling a skateboard, Rob, put your face on it so I can sell it in stores. It's more like, hey, do you like this food? This is going to create some good in the world. Do you want to be involved? Well, so you you talk about relationships, and that's really important to me. I, I've, I'm someone that I value my relationships. I like to add value. I like to add a lot more value than than what I'm taking. Um, and so that's something that I've really focused on over the years is not only building relationships but providing value to those relationships. And if you if you just sell someone without giving value in these days, I mean that might have worked. 20, 30 years ago. But these days, if you're not giving value to someone, then people don't have the, the attention span. They don't have the time. They don't, they don't they have the interest, frankly, to just hear your pitch. But someone listening to this and saying, well, I'm young still. I haven't built up all my relationships in five different industries like this guy has. How do I deliver value? How do I build up, the, reach out to those first group of people that I want to deliver value to? Well, you could. You don't have to have a lot of money to do that. You don't have to be. You don't have to have the wisdom of doing it for many years. You could be right out of college. You could be right out of high school. You could be in high school and do it. You could. There's for something that you do and that you do well that can benefit someone else. And if you have an agenda behind your your give, then it's going to be transparent. It's going to people are going to see through it. I get LinkedIn. I don't usually use that much because every time I open LinkedIn. And I accept requests. The immediate thing is that someone sells me, sends me a message on LinkedIn trying to sell something. And, and I don't read it. I don't even look at it. And by the way, even if they try to give something, I usually don't like it. Because if someone says to you, um, and I've talked about this here before, but I'm curious what you would say. If someone says to you, Bill, I really admire what you're doing. I'm a young guy. I, uh, I want to be an entrepreneur. I'll do anything you would like me to do. What would, how can I help you? What, what, what would you like me to do? I sort of find that to be annoying. I, I agree too. It's like homework assignment for me. That's right. That's exactly right. Like if you have to spend the time training someone and teaching someone uh, because they're offering their time for you, you you have to factor into what amount of time is gonna it's gonna cost you. And so what I think anyone can do is you 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 could you could stand out in any way. You could stand out in a cold message on LinkedIn. You could stand out, but do do something that's gonna really show that you're innovative, that you're thinking differently, that you're not just following the same model of trying to sell your stuff or figure out a way to, you know, get your message through, but do something really different. Like I, I, I had Gary Vaynerchuk as an investor, not in this company, but in a, in a prior company. I didn't know who Gary was. I didn't have a relationship with him. I didn't know anyone that had relationships with him. I found people that knew him. I gave them value. Then they introduced me to Gary. When How did you I, give them value? Well, so there's one guy was moving to California and he uh, was looking to raise money. And uh, I didn't know him, but I saw him on social media and I saw that he had interviewed Gary. He had a, a podcast and he had interviewed Gary. And so he, uh, he, and he, on his Facebook profile, it said that he liked, he had a pit bull and it said he was into raw food. So I emailed him and the subject of my email was pit bulls and raw food. I knew that would grab his attention because it was something he was interested in mm -hmm. and not something that he talked a lot about, but I just saw that those were things he was interested in. And then I said, I, I heard you're moving to California. I'd be happy to connect you with all of the people I know here. And I saw you're raising money. I've raised hundreds of millions. Happy to review all of your docs and give you any input on how to make your raise very successful. Of course, he grabbed at that. I gave him that value. And then we got to know each other, develop a relationship. I'm still friends with him. He actually was the one that introduced me to Lewis Howes. And then Lewis introduced me to Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary Vaynerchuk, when I was in dialogue with him, I sent him a bottle of champagne from his own wine store. Hmm. And I said, we're going to crack this open together as we celebrate the success of this company. And it stood out for him because it was one, I shopped at his store, which he appreciated. I bought not only a gift for him, but I bought it from a place where he was making money. 
And uh, I, I, I did it in a way that it stood out. Ed Milet is an investor with us in Outstanding Foods. Ed has this really amazing story that he had um, the shitbox type of car, but he wrapped it so it looked like a Mercedes. And so I bought him a bottle of Andre champagne and I put a wrapper around it that was Dom Perignon. And I, <laughs> I said, you know, just like your car, this is the beginning of our relationship. And then I sent him a bottle of Don Perignon. And I said, but this is the one that we're gonna use to celebrate, hold on to this one. And so, you know, you, you could be anyone without the benefit of, of experience, without the benefit of relationships and just think creatively, how are you gonna stand out? And you're not gonna do that by just connecting with someone on LinkedIn and just selling them. I had someone just yesterday, I, I pushed yes, accept. And I got two emails from the guy where he's like, this is the best deal you'll ever want to see. Read all these. Yeah, and and I, just, I just scanned the email and it was like, in, in this day and age, you can't even send a long email because no one's going to read it, let alone, you know, the, 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 have as many attachments and all these things. So you could do something to stand out and do something that is like what people would call growth hacking, what we used to call guerrilla marketing, where you're doing something to, to, to really make a splash but where you're actually giving value, not not looking to take something from someone right away. What's like the first time you did something like that, like younger in your career? What was that four years old, knocking on someone's door and offering, I wanted to get this magic kit in the back of a magazine. And so literally, I, I, and I, like, I have an almost seven-year-old daughter right now. And I, I was thinking about this a couple of years ago when she was five. And I'm like, there's no way in the world that would let her go door to door. But uh, we, we lived in the suburbs in New York when I was a kid and that the times were different. And I was going door to door at four and five years old. And so at four or five years old, knocking on someone's door and telling them that you could have these really great vegetables. All you have to do is plant the seed and water it. And, you know, really, you know, trying to like show them what uh, they can get out of it when, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I'm going to get this magic kit. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions 
and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. So, okay, so fast forwarding now, you you have... The, the the dream team, at least for the initial round, you have Chef Dave, you have a bunch of investors, which include a, a lot of influencers um, like like Rob Drydeck and, you know, other people. And uh, uh, and then you had, did you have strategic investors who were involved with some of the major stores? We have, we have some strategic investors that aren't necessarily influencers that that are opening some doors. But, you know, as like anything, as you progress in advance, you start, whether you're that kid right out of school or in school and you're starting a business or whether you have experience, anytime you start a new company, you're starting from scratch. You, you could leverage a lot of your wisdom and experience and relationships, but you're starting from scratch. So with this company, we initially outsourced our sales. And then as we started building momentum, we were able to attract much more highly talented people. The same thing we've done with our influencers. We're doing with our sales team. We're doing with our own team. So we, we I recruited someone that uh, was the VP of sales at Simple Mills that she helped them grow from less than a million to about 90 million. She joined us in November of 2019 and she's amazing. She's killing it for us right now, getting into a lot of retail distribution. Um, but yes, other strategic investors that are helping open open some other doors. And then, uh, you know, through this, you've been developing the products. Remember you had the first product, which was the bacon chips you got everywhere. And, but then you kind of pulled back on that. Now I'm holding in my hand the pigless pork rinds. Uh, was there a shift? How did you shift strategy here a little bit? Well, th this was a natural progression, this product, mm -hmm. because we already established the brand pig out and w anything bacon or pork related is under that brand vertical. We have plans for other verticals uh, for, for different categories. Because that was my favorite. That uh, on that one lunch a long time ago. Well, we, we have a lot of different products on our roadmap and, and uh, that's one of them that we'll get to. Uh, but it, it was a natural progression for this product. Our first product, we're, we're gonna go through a version 2.0 to scale up the manufacturing on that. That one had more challenges because we were using mushrooms and slicing the mushrooms for that product. This one, we have the capacity to go much broader and that's what we're doing. We're, we're going to convenience stores, we're going to grocery stores, we're going to QVC, we're selling it online, we're going to be in big box retailers soon. And, and so this one has a much wider appeal because of the product and the value proposition, but also because we can make more. So like from my perspective and the way you're talking about it, it almost seems like every moment has been very magical. Like you, you, you get the most amazing product development guy in the world for this. You bring on this great group of investors, then you're going to be in all the stores and then you Snoop Dogg to endorse this. 
what, uh, what bad thing, what, was there any moment during this process? Like I find with entrepreneurship, there's, there's always moments of like just stark, mad fear that I'm going to make a fool out of myself. This is not going to work and everyone's going to hate me. So that happens every day. And, and the reality is that, you know, there's challenges in everything in life, whether it's a business or relationships or, or anything. And so we have challenges daily. I have challenges daily. We've had challenges with, you know, R and D and product mix and manufacturing and a, and a variety of other things. And so, you know, the, the, the one thing that any entrepreneur who's successful has in common is the, their ability to persevere and figure out and navigate the obstacles and the challenges and see them as opportunities, see them as learning uh, uh, possibilities and course correcting when you need to course correct. I, I course correct daily. I, there's oftentimes where I might be reactionary and say something to someone on our team or someone that we work with and I'll reflect. I have a, a practice of reflection. And if I see that, hey, I, I was reacting, then I'll own it and I'll talk to you, whoever I reacted to and meet that challenge head on. Those are, you know, some day-to-day -day types of things. But yeah, of course, we've had all types of challenges. But how do you deal with like doubt? So for instance, if, if you run down a, a bad road in product development or if you hit a bunch of stores and they're just like, eh, we don't like it, it's not for us. Like, and then you start to really, you know, because you, you've, you've given them status just by the fact that you're pitching them or, you know, a bunch of focus group says, ah, we don't really like this food. Like, so again, you're giving status to some group and you have to, you have to reasonably handle their criticism, but it could cause doubt, even though this is something you've believed in for decades and you've, you've built it up perfectly, doubt must occur. And how do you, sometimes doubt, you can't just pivot. You have to actually question, is this good or not? Yeah. So I think, you know, there's two components to that, in my opinion. One is that it's great to get feedback, but you shouldn't blow in the wind of every time you hear someone's opinion. You should, you should take it in. You should value everyone's opinion, but that you should hear more of a consensus. And even sometimes, you know, with a, with a brand, the consensus that lacks the perspective. Like I met with, I won't mention the name, but a multi-billion dollar food company that was interested in investing with us. They wanted to invest. We didn't let them into our last round, but they, they told me that half of the people in their office didn't like our brand, not the flavor of the product, but the brand. They thought it was too edgy, too over the top, too um, uh, in your face. And I actually said to them, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that because your brand is much more traditional. You're not, you're not a brand for millennials. You're a brand for, you know, moms that are, you know, in their fifties or sixties now. And so the look, the feel, the voice, the image of the brand that you're, that the people in your company are used to are very different than ours. So I could have taken the view, Hey, there's this multi-billion dollar company that half of their employees think our brand is shit. And just completely scrap everything we were doing and run to their opinion and change. But I knew that they didn't have that sensibility. A lot of bigger companies don't. Blockbuster certainly didn't when the market was mm -hmm. changing. And so, you know, there's certain feedback that you have to listen to, but you have to process it through the lens of where is it coming from and what's the perspective. And and I, I don't get it because like, I'm looking at this. Okay, I don't know what edgy means because you're a snack food. So it's got to be a little playful, right? People eat snacks when they're playing. <laughs> yeah, we have one of our flavors is called Hella, uh, Hella Hot. We have one of our taglines is, is tasty as hell. And so for, you know, a more conservative ah. brand, those things are too much in your face. Those things are too controversial. Uh, the, the, the pig, um, you know, on, on a bag, you know, that's a cartoon character, uh, for some conservative brands that, you know, are very Fortune 500 looking um, in the food category, uh, their, their sensibility is in a certain lane. And they might not have the sensibility of what the new market wants and what the new generation of consumers are looking for, both in, in terms of product, taste, profile, and of course, brand. So you have to listen to all feedback, but process it and value it all, but know where it's coming from. And then the other thing is, you know, belief doesn't mean having tunnel vision. Belief means that if you believe in something, you're able to course correct, you're able to adapt. That's also one of the biggest skills of an entrepreneur is to adapt and not just be locked into one way of doing it. And so, you know, hearing that feedback is one of the greatest things you can get as an entrepreneur. I always like to go to our trade shows and 
watch people try our product and, and have that firsthand experience so I can see directly and personally how people are reacting to it and then process that information and take that back to the lab and, and confer with Dave and, and give that feedback. And, um, but, you know, really like the ability to adapt not only in your product, but in the way you position it, the way you market it, doesn't mean that your belief change. You, you could have the belief in yourself, in your team and what you're doing and the market opportunity, but sometimes you have to course correct and, and adapt and make changes along the way. And what's the, what's the biggest uh, kind of pivot you had to do in this? One that where you wished you could change the product overnight, but you knew it would take a few months or however long. Well, our first product, we were in R&D for the better part of a couple of years. Mm. And so it was a, a very complicated product. We have IP on it. We have a patent pending on it because we created a really unique process. But it was a very capital intensive process. It was a very, like I said, the manufacturing of that product wasn't as scalable. And so, you know, there were a lot of lessons that we learned from that that we took into this where we, we're using readily available ingredients. We're using a manufacturing process that doesn't, the innovation is more in the taste and the, the nutrition and the texture rather than the process. So we took those lessons, we applied it in this, and now in, our, our, in moving forward, um, all of our product development is going to be really in, in, the, in the same uh, fast to market. This product from idea to in the bag took less than six months, which is very fast for a food product. The first and, one, and, it's, and it's going out, on the, when's it going out on the stores? Or it's already in it, the stores? Yes, yeah, in the stores by the time this airs. Hmm. And, uh, uh, so, okay, Snoop Dogg. Yes. How, how'd that happen? Because that has to be the biggest product endorsement in history. Yeah, well- Like, I don't know of any snack food where Snoop Dogg or someone at that level- is I just saw a, a, a video you showed me where he's like snacking with the pig on, yeah, you know, after you know smoking and uh, and he's just enjoying himself. I've never seen anything like that. It, it, you know, it, it's the you build on everything, and so you're building on sales, you're building on product development, you're building on investors, you're building on everything. Everything is a is a process where you don't just land Snoop Dogg when you have an idea in your head. You land Snoop Dogg or, or people like Snoop when you've advanced, where you've shown that you know what you're doing, where you're gaining a foothold in the market, where you have credibility, uh, a lot of social proof. When we when we got Rob Deerdeck and we have Dirks Bentley and Caesar Milan and the singer and the drummer from Fall Out Boy and countless others, all that adds social proof, all that adds credibility so that when a Snoop is introduced, then there's more of a foundation that is attractive to someone of his stature. And so I was introduced to his manager. We developed a relationship. They were, uh, he was an ambassador to Beyond Meat and had equity in Beyond Meat before Snoop. they went public. Yes, yeah, Snoop. Mm. And so uh, he's not plant-based, he's not vegan, um, but he loved our, our product and uh, the content we created with him, I, I can't wait to release it. It's funny, it's engaging. He loves the product, but he he's become. I, I was I'm, you and I also have a commonality where we love rap and old mm -hmm. school rap in particular. And I've I've always, always been a fan of Snoop when he was with Dre and broke out on his own. And well, if you think about all those guys too, like look at Fifty Cent made whatever four hundred million on vitamin water. Dr. Dre just made a huge amount on or beats. not juice, but several years ago made a huge amount on beats. Snoop Dogg's probably been looking for his. His beats. Now, I, I guess he was involved in Beyond Meat. He must have made some money, but he's more on the ground floor with this. So uh, he's probably has has big dreams. Well, we have big dreams with him. And so, you know, yeah, we're we're extremely happy to have him on board. I mean, I'm, I've been a fan of his forever. And uh, but he's he's become a true tastemaker and, you know, a, 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 you know, a true influencer. You know, he's he's a, you know, a true um, uh, person that you know, is a cultural icon now. And, um, but he's, he is funny, man. He is, and he is, I, I was calling him one take Snoop on the set. He was just nailing everything. We have so much content with him and our, and our mascot, our pig mascot. And so I'm, I'm really excited to release all that and, and for people to, you know, really be entertained by it. But also, uh, I think it's going to attract a big market to us and it will likely attract other people of his caliber that either come in as an investor or, you know, some kind of collaboration. And what does what does that look like? Like, so you 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 meet his manager. You ha you say, hey, Snoop like might want to try this. He tries it. He likes it. What happens next? Does the manager call you and say Snoop would like to get involved? And you say you don't just say sure. Like, there's obviously there's 
there's some transaction there, right? That you have to make a deal with him if he's going to be a spokesperson. Do you pay him money? Do, like what, what happens next? Yeah, well, he came in as an investor. And mm-hmm. so he's an investor, but... Um, Which is rare because he could have just said, I don't want to invest, but I'm willing to do this. Yes. And I want an equity in your company. Yeah. So, you know, which is a lot, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, in the past, you mentioned 50 Cent. 50 Cent was really a paradigm shifter. In the past, celebrities didn't really invest. They they got paid cash. Uh, but 50 Cent, when he made all that money on vitamin water, that, that really changed the game. And then you've had, you know, people like Ashton Kutcher and, um, you know, many other celebrities that have been investing in things they believe in and making money because they've been smart about the companies they've chosen to invest in. So that's really opened it up where the agents and the managers are now not in the way, but they're encouraging these types of deals where where their clients invest because it, it actually, you know, if they were investing in the right companies, it, it's good image for them as well, that they're into something that's healthy or something that is, mm. you know, doing well, uh, d- doing well for, for other people. Um, but yeah, I mean, when that process happens, you know, in, in any of these Hollywood deals, they always take a longer time than they should because there's a lot of people in the mix. But yes, I mean, I, we went through the process of meeting his management team of, you know, figuring out the right way to, uh, bring him in. And then, you know, there was a process of his time, his schedule, he was on tour getting the the shoot date. You know, we had to be patient and, in, in figuring out, you know, all the, the logistics, even though we were anxious to shoot with him as soon as possible. But, you, you know, there's a lot of relationship building in that process to inspire confidence and, and, and enroll people to uh, really want to be a part of what we're doing. And, and what, do you, what do you hope from, like, what do you gain from, I can imagine a lot of in celebrity endorsements just turn out to be useless. Like, what do you hope to gain from Snoop's endorsement? I kind of see this one being useful, but I'm just curious, what, how do you think about goals in terms of this? Well, they're, they're aligned with the mission of the company, which is to make plant-based foods accessible to anyone because they taste great. And, and not because we're preaching or judging people for their choices, but because we're giving them great tasting alternatives. And so someone like Snoop helps us reach the market that we're trying to, we're trying to influence. And so, you know, we have no problem reaching people who are vegan or vegetarian. We have many other personalities and marketing that we're doing to reach people in the mainstream. But someone like Snoop, who's so iconic and has such a big following in social media and in the media, um, is someone that really can help expedite our mission of reaching more people and making an impact by providing delicious, nutritious plant-based products to them. And, uh, um, you know, in terms of, oh, you were telling me also you're getting on QVC. Like, how does that happen? How how can I develop a product that gets on QVC? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, we're in a we're in the right place at the right time. I mean, that wasn't the plan, and that when we started, we weren't. But you know, you and I have a lot of financial relationships. I, I've been vegan for thirty years, and I was telling you that you know I've I've probably been to more steakhouses than most meat eaters because I I was in the financial world here in New York, and some of my New York finance buddies are dropping term sheets in my lap saying, we, we, we see the opportunity now since Beyond Meat's wildly successful IPO and we want to invest in your company and other companies in the space. So, you know, we're, we're really at the convergence of the two biggest trends in food, plant-based meats better for you, healthier snacks. And so in that market, there are, there's consumer demand that are driving a lot of the distribution and a lot, driving a lot of the interest. And so QVC has had other plant-based products on their show that have done really, really well. They've been actively seeking new products that are packaged that they can ship easily. And in the span of one week, we had three QVC brokers that came to us. Really? Um, we weren't even seeking that out. Three of them came to us. We interviewed them. We, we went with the one we felt was the best fit. And instantly they got the buyer to try the product. They love the product and paperwork, agreements, and on the air. And so what happens? They figure out the show and the host and how they're going to pitch it and so on? Yeah, we get to choose the on-air host mm-hmm. that works with one of the QVC hosts. Uh, they QVC will, will usually try you on a certain shorter time segment, usually six to eight minutes, which is what we're getting initially. And QVC is all about dollars per minute. So how many dollars per minute you generate determines not only how long your next segment is, or if you have a next segment, but how frequently they're going to have you back. And so we haven't been on QVC or maybe at the time of this airing, we, we have been. Uh, but if you see us on QVC more than once, it's because we're By reaching 
their their dollars per minute. Well, okay. Well, I mean, everything's great, basically. Like, Everything is outstanding. <laughs> outstanding <laughs> foods, pigless pork rinds. I've been dying because you sent a box of the foods last night, uh, the, of the, the different flavors. I have, I'm holding in my hand the original one. There's the kind of the hot one and the extra hot one. And I've been dying to eat this for the past hour while we've been talking. I, I didn't realize... I. I realized too late it's going to be too noisy to eat while we're in the podcast. So I'm going to have to finish this podcast off soon just so I can start eating these because I'm really hungry. But uh, what's next? What's the next thing? You're going to develop, develop new products? Yes. So we're we're in retail distribution. We're staying in the snack food category because we're, we're dealing with distribution there. We have a, a product that will be out in the middle of this year that will have even more nutrition in a snack food. So really shifting that paradigm from... Most people, you eat a bag of chips and you and you it, it it fills you up, but you're just getting a fat and a salt bomb. You're not getting much nutrition. There's often empty calories, and so we this the pig out pork rinds have the highest amount of protein in a plant based snack on the market right now. Uh, so we're we're looking at adding other nutrients so you can not only get the protein but get other nutrients while you're having an enjoyable, really great tasting snack. Uh, we are working on bacon strip. Um, and a bacon pizza topping that will go into food service distribution in restaurants. What, what about the burger? Can you start to compete with like the Impossible Burger and the Beyond Burger, or is that too big a market now? Well, I think, you know, what what is, in my opinion, going to be the next big wave in plant-based are more health-inspiring ingredients. So Beyond and Impossible had all the elements where people didn't have to incorporate a new habit, but when people start self-identifying as, as either being plant-based or eating more plant-based foods, they, they tend to have more curiosity of what else is out there. And they tend to be even more inquisitive about what are the ingredients in these things and can I find something that has even healthier ingredients. So I think Beyond has done you know, a really great job of getting to market and, and their, part of their ethos is to develop more uh, natural and health-inspiring ingredients. And I think they're gonna lead the next wave as well. But I think in that next wave, there's gonna be plenty of room for companies that are matching the taste and texture of meat, but using more health inspiring ingredients where you you could pronounce the ingredients, you could know what those ingredients are when you read the package. And we we hope to be part of that uh, that next wave in plant-based of uh, providing really great tasting products, but with ingredients that are more whole foods and more health inspiring. What about things like Memphis meats where it's meat, but it's it's not coming from an animal. It's, it's basically grown in the lab, I guess, from, I, I don't know, from stem cells or something. So could that, for people who aren't philosophically vegan or plant-based and they want meat, but they, but they understand they don't want to eat animals anymore. They have some, they have some weird or different approach to eating where they're not going to be vegetarians, but they're not going to eat meat either. So Memphis meats where their meats are grown in the labs, do you see that as competitive with this if it gets huge? Not necessarily. I think I think we're also in a in a place where the market is wide open. It's it's very nascent. Even though Beyond and Impossible are both multi billion dollar companies, we're still very early. And there's you know certainly the scientific approach that uh, could work. We'll we'll have to see you know how their uh, technology develops over time. But the market is big enough. I, I you know I'm not someone that is hyper competitive. I, I think I, you know I come from an abundance mindset. And so you know if you have great great products and anything you're doing and and really way to differentiate them and sell the value proposition, then you can compete in any market. So I want you to, I want, where can people, I want, I want to, I want to go online and buy. I have never bought online. You just always send me a box of food. Like where can I go and buy online? Outstandingfoods.com. And I can buy these uh, yep. pork rinds and then uh, Kroger's, I guess, and, and Whole Foods and QVC maybe. Yes. So. Yeah. We're, we're it, our initial stores are going to be in, late September, uh, sorry, late February, early March, and then progressively we'll, we'll be essentially everywhere. Like every store that I could imagine. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the bigger chain stores plan their shelf space many months in advance. So it's not like a company comes out with a new product and they're everywhere right away. So it will be a progressive build and some of the bigger stores will progressively come on after the independence and some of the, uh, some of the stores where we're catching the timing right. Well, uh, Bill Glazer, CEO of Outstanding Foods, we've tried to work together for years ever since we met. Again, I can't remember if it was 2012 or 2013 or 2014. I think it was 2013. And we met at the Tim Ferriss four-hour chef dinner, but we had been communicating before then. And it's just funny how 
relationships, you know, that you sort of nurture and grow with over time do result. And, and then also on the side, when you're also pursuing business that you truly believe in, as opposed to just trying to make money, those two things kind of coalesce together and it works out. And hopefully this business works out, but regardless, I know I'm going to be this, this bag of chips is going to be gone in about <laughs> four minutes. So that works oh, out man, at the very I'm, least. <laughs> well, I, I'm disappointed I, because I thought it should, I, I thought you'd be done with that in two minutes. I, it might be a minute. We'll see. But also, congratulations on Snoop Dogg. That's huge, huge news. I'm really looking forward to how the public views that video you just showed me. Well, so. that's one of many. But yeah, we're really, really excited about Snoop. And and Snoop, we're, there's going to be a website called Pig Out with, uh, pigoutwithsnoop.com that will showcase our products, but we'll have a little bit of a Snoop flavor to it. You got to tell me, anytime he's just over your house, like smoking and eating these chips... I'm just going to come over there and do a podcast with him and just show up. Hey, Bill, I didn't know you had friends over. <laughs> and so you just got to give me a call when. And uh, thanks for coming on the podcast, Bill. Well, thanks for having me, James. Yeah, really no appreciate problem. It. Looking to save big on holiday shopping? Xfinity Mobile has you covered. Now through January 10th, Ask how existing Xfinity customers can get a free unlimited intro line for a year when they buy one line of unlimited. Plus, see how to get $400 off an eligible 5G phone. Visit XfinityMobile.com, call 1-800-XFINITY, or visit a store today. Restrictions apply. Xfinity Mobile requires Xfinity Internet. Reduce speeds after 20 gigabytes of usage per line. Data thresholds may vary.